Obi-Wan Kenobi was born on the planet Stujan before being taken to Coruscant by the Jedi at a very young age. He grew up in the Jedi Temple there, becoming close friends with other initiates Bant Eren and Garen Moon, while studying under masters like Vant, Sindralig, and Yoda. As he grew into adolescence, he also made a rival in initiate Bruk Chun, who often bullied the young Obi-Wan. Chun managed to provoke aggression in Obi-Wan, one of his greatest flaws in his youth. As Obi-Wan approached the age of 13, he was informed that if a master did not select him to become an apprentice, he would be sent to work for the Jedi Agricorps as a farmer. Just before it would be too late, Master Qui-Gon Jinn came to watch the initiates compete. Jinn had a reputation for never taking apprentices after his second apprentice, Xanatos, ended in failure. But Obi-Wan was determined to impress the master. A fierce victory over Chun made Obi-Wan think he may have managed to win Qui-Gon over, but his determination was actually his downfall. Xanatos' fall to the dark side made Jin wary of taking another apprentice easily susceptible to anger. Obi-Wan was sent to the planet Bandomir to join the Agricorps. In what Yoda assured Qui-Gon was the will of the Force and not the old master's designs, Qui-Gon was sent to Bandomir on a mission at the same time as Obi-Wan. While on the ship en route to Bandomir, the two came together to stop the schemes of a hut working for the Offworld Mining Corporation. Upon arriving at their destination, they came to realize that the power behind Offworld was none other than Qui-Gon's former apprentice, Xenatos. Negotiations between the Republic's representatives and Offworld were a trap by Xenatos to kill his old master, which Obi-Wan helped Qui-Gon in stopping. Despite a rocky start to their relationship, Qui-Gon came to recognize Obi-Wan's potential and finally agreed to take the boy as his apprentice. Obi-Wan turned 13 shortly after and his new master gifted him a river stone that came from Qui-Gon's homeworld. Obi-Wan was initially disappointed, having hoped for a more extravagant gift, but came to realize during their following mission to Findar that the stone was force-sensitive in its own way and invaluable. While on Findar, a criminal organization attempted to wipe Obi-Wan's memories, but using the stone, Obi-Wan was able to focus and even uncover fragments of memories he believed to be from his childhood of a brother named Owen. Years later, Obi-Wan would gift the Riverstone to Anakin for his own 13th birthday. Obi-Wan's next greatest trial came on the planet Melinda Dan. He and Qui-Gon were sent to the planet to resolve a civil war between the Melinda and the Dan. It was there that Obi-Wan developed a bond with the Young, a faction of youths on the planet who rebelled against their parents' pointless war. He even grew romantically attached to a girl named Sarasi, and he decided to leave the Jedi to help the young stop the war. The faction grew increasingly corrupted by the war as they fought, until Sarasi's death ended the conflict and brought peace back to the planet. Obi-Wan was allowed to return to the Order, but his relationship with Qui-Gon was damaged. Soon after Obi-Wan's return to Coruscant, Xanatos launched an assault on the temple. While trying to stop this attack, Obi-Wan came to realize that his old rival, Brook Chun, had fallen to the dark side and had been recruited by Qui-Gon's former Padawan. Chun kidnapped Bant and engaged Obi-Wan in a duel above a waterfall in the temple's Room of a Thousand Fountains. Chun slipped on the edge of the waterfall and, despite Obi-Wan's best efforts to save him, fell to his death. After stealing funds for his corporations from the temple, Xanatos retreated to his homeworld of Telos. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon pursued and managed to expose Xanatos' evil actions to the people of Telos, turning them against him. When backed into a corner, Xanatos chose to fall into a pool of acid and die, hoping to scar Qui-Gon emotionally. With Melinda Dan and Xanatos behind them, Qui-Gon accompanied Obi-Wan to Illum to construct his first lightsaber, which proved to be a bonding experience for the pair. Once the blade was complete, they received a call for a mission on Ord Sigdat, it was there, while investigating the disappearance of a Republic refinery ship, that Obi-Wan met Dexter Jetster, who was running a bar and selling weapons to the locals. Despite Dexter's technically illegal actions, the two forged a friendship that would last decades. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon were paired with fellow Master and Apprentice duo Adi Galia and Siri Taki for a mission to the planet Keegan to recover a Force-sensitive child. Obi-Wan and Siri's relationship 
had a rough beginning, with her angry at him for having left the Order, but the two grew close over the course of their missions together. While later working with a number of other Jedi to stop the Stark hyperspace conflict, Obi-Wan bonded with another Padawan his age, Quinlan Vos. Another important mission came when Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, Adi, and Ciri worked together to investigate the rogue scientist Jenna Zen Arbor, who was conducting deadly experiments on Force sensitives. Qui-Gon was kidnapped by Zen Arbor and nearly died during her experiments, but Obi-Wan and the others managed to rescue him with the help of their friends Didi and Astri Otto, who owned a cafe that would eventually become Dex's diner. Perhaps the greatest trial of Obi-Wan's apprenticeship came when he and Qui-Gon were sent to help end a civil war on the planet Mandalore. They spent a year on the planet serving as bodyguards for the young Duchess Satine Kreis, who was the leader of a pacifist group within Mandalorian culture. Obi-Wan and Satine fell in love as they traveled the Mandalore sector, to the point that Obi-Wan would have left the order for her, but they ultimately each returned to the roles their people needed them to serve. Obi-Wan was not the only one tested by the strain of romantic bonds. Qui-Gon had his own trial as well. Qui-Gon disobeyed the orders of the Council to travel with Obi-Wan to New Absalon after receiving visions of his longtime close friend and fellow Jedi Tal in danger. Tal had indeed been kidnapped, and by the time Qui-Gon came to a rescue, it was too late, and the two confessed their love for each other on her deathbed. Obi-Wan's master nearly fell to the dark side in a hunt for revenge, and young Obi-Wan himself was left to deal with the fact that a respected Jedi and friend could die like that. Over the following years, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon carried out missions to planets like Frego, Vorzid IV, and Cirrus, their partnership solidifying further. The pair were called to help a cruise liner under attack from sabotage, the Orient Express, and to investigate a missing cargo freighter on Ord Mantell. A mission to Obradan, when Obi-Wan was 25, left him with the impression that the Trade Federation was working against the best interests of the Republic and the Jedi, something that was soon proven right when the faction blockaded the peaceful world of Naboo. Chancellor Valorum dispatched Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon to resolve the dispute peacefully, but upon arriving on the Trade Federation flagship, the Nemoidians attacked the Jedi and destroyed their courier ship. The duo managed to sneak onto the planet by infiltrating droid invasion craft, where they made contact with Naboo's native Gungans via the outcast Jar Jar Binks. The Gungans helped them gain passage to the planet's capital city, Theed, where they rescued Queen Padme, Amidala, and the other city officials. After fighting their way through droids in the palace hangar, the Jedi, the Queen, and their party managed to escape through the blockade in a royal starship, though the ship took damage while fleeing. Forced to stop on the desert world Tatooine in hut space, Qui-Gon left Obi-Wan with the ship while he went in search of the parts they needed for repairs. The Queen's decoy, who Obi-Wan still believed to be the real Queen, was kidnapped by Tusken Raiders while they awaited Qui-Gon's return. Obi-Wan was forced into combat with the Tusken Warchief to free her. The Tuscans surprisingly accepted defeat when Obi-Wan won the fight and released the Queen to him. When Qui-Gon returned with needed repair parts, he brought with him a surprising new addition to their party, a young boy named Anakin Skywalker that Qui-Gon had freed from slavery after realizing the boy's strong affinity for the Force. Obi-Wan disagreed with Qui-Gon's decision to bring the boy with them to Coruscant, and his concern deepened after an assailant with a red lightsaber attacked the group as they left Tatooine. Qui-Gon requested that the Council allow him to take the young Skywalker as an apprentice, insisting that Obi-Wan was ready to face the trials and become a Jedi Knight. Despite his worries that Skywalker was too old to be trained, Obi-Wan was grateful for the faith his master showed in him. The Jedi and the boy then accompanied Queen Amidala back to Naboo in an effort to retake the planet after the Senate proved unhelpful. On Naboo, the Jedi engaged the red-bladed assassin, a Sith Lord named Darth Maul. The Sith fought them brutally in a long fight that took them through the entire palace plasma refinery complex. Eventually, the Jedi were split from each other by the facility's laser gates, leaving Maul alone with Qui-Gon. Obi-Wan's master fought valiantly, but fell in battle to the Sith, sending the young Jedi into a rage. Obi-Wan's anger was almost his downfall once more, but he calmed himself and reached into the Force to defeat Maul using his master's blade, sending the Sith tumbling to an assumed death. Obi-Wan ran to cradle Qui-Gon in the older Jedi's final moments, tearfully agreeing to fulfill his master's final wish to train the young Skywalker himself. The Council was impressed by Obi-Wan's defeat of the Sith, 
and reluctantly agreed to Qui-Gon's wish. Anakin Skywalker was to be Obi-Wan's apprentice. Despite the many troubles that had plagued the boy's upbringing, the two bonded quickly and deeply. Their first mission together was one with a connection to Obi-Wan's past, to investigate a cult led by Cad Chun, the younger brother of Obi-Wan's childhood rival who had died fighting him. Cad ultimately forgave Obi-Wan for his role in Brooke's death, bringing catharsis for both of them. The two were also sent to investigate the disappearance of Jedi Knight Verge on the living world Zonoma Secta. Though they never realized it, Verge had been taken by an early scouting party of Uzong Vaughn many decades prior to their invasion of the galaxy. Though they were unable to help Verge, Obi-Wan and Anakin did manage to save the living planet from an attempt by Wilhuff Tarkin to exploit its unique properties, though Obi-Wan was disturbed by a display of rage Anakin showed in the process. When Anakin was 13 years old, Obi-Wan accompanied him to Illum for the construction of his first lightsaber, as Qui-Gon had once done with him. Their next mission involved Obi-Wan's old friend Ciri, who had gone undercover in a slaver operation on Nar Shutta. Disturbed by the reminders of his past, Anakin once again displayed a troubling amount of anger and killed the crime lord in charge of the operation. Ciri and her new apprentice Ferris Olin became frequent collaborators and partners of the duo, starting on a mission to Radnor with the few other fellow Jedi and apprentices. Master Windu assigned Obi-Wan and Anakin with supervising the headstrong and standoffish Jedi Master Joris Sabayoth, who was preparing to go on the outbound flight project that aimed to travel beyond the edge of the galaxy. Obi-Wan did not get along with the Jedi Master and his attitude towards the citizens of the ship, but Chancellor Palpatine requested Anakin and Obi-Wan settle a dispute elsewhere before the ship made it out of Republic space. Unbeknownst to the pair, Darth Sidious always intended for the mission to fail, and didn't want Anakin to die with it. During a training mission, Anakin and Obi-Wan had their first encounter with a man named Granta Omega, a very wealthy man with the ability to hide himself from the Force and a grudge against the Jedi. Following incidents with Omega on Rangoon 6 and Usirin, the mysterious enemy released a chemical weapon on Mawan that caused the death of Jedi Master Yaddle. Omega revealed to Obi-Wan that he was the son of Xanatos, the reason behind his wealth, mysterious relationship with the Force, and hunt for revenge. The stress of these incidents caused a strain in the relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin, as Obi-Wan once again feared he wasn't fit to be the boy's teacher. But a mission to Vancor involving Gundarks and the scientist from Obi-Wan's youth, Jenna Zan Arbor, brought the two back together. The Jedi later discovered that Arbor had aligned herself with Omega and Senator Sano Sauru in a plot to weaken Jedi support in the Senate and assassinate the Chancellor. Though the plot was prevented, a number of Senators died in the process, and the Jedi pursued Omega to Korriban. Omega had been in contact with ex-Jedi Master and new Sith apprentice Count Dooku during these plans, and had gained knowledge about the Sith's designs, which he taunted Obi-Wan with when Obi-Wan was forced to kill him in combat. During the mission on Korriban, Anakin's arrogance and jealousy accidentally caused the death of a fellow Padawan and a friend. Ferris resigned from the Order over the incident, but its true cause remained unknown to Obi-Wan, who had more faith in his apprentice than ever before. The pair were assigned to protect Senator Simon Greyshade following the murder of Greyshade's predecessor and cousin over his support for a bill designed to reduce corruption in the Senate. Though the Jedi exposed the fallen Senate guard behind the murder, the bill was never voted on, and corruption in the Senate only continued to increase. It wasn't long before systems began to secede from the Republic, and a separatist crisis spearheaded by Count Dooku dominated the galaxy. A border dispute on the planet Ancien, which had complex treaties entangling it with the many vital systems surrounding it, risked the world falling into the hands of the separatists. The Council sent Obi-Wan, Anakin, Luminara Unduli, and Barriss Afi to prevent this from happening. Separatist leadership made the negotiations difficult for the Jedi, forcing them to fight for their lives, but the Jedi managed the incredible feat of forging peace among the planet's warring tribes without any lives lost. Upon their return to Coruscant, Obi-Wan and Anakin were assigned to protect their old friend Padme Amidala, who was now the senator for Naboo, and had been the target of an assassination attempt over her opposition to the Military Creation Act. A bounty hunter again attempted to kill the senator under their watch, and the Jedi pursued the assassin until she herself was killed from afar by another bounty hunter. While Anakin protected the senator, Obi-Wan followed a trail that eventually led him to Kamino, where the Kaminoan cloners 
had produced a clone army for the Republic under the request of a long-dead Jedi Master. The template for this army was bounty hunter Jango Fett, whom Obi-Wan realized was behind the assassination attempts. He pursued Fett to Geonosis, where he was captured by the true culprits, Count Dooku and his Separatist alliance. Anakin and Padme attempted to come to Obi-Wan's rescue on Geonosis, only to be captured themselves. The trio were placed in an arena to be executed by beasts in front of a crowd, but the Jedi and the new clone army arrived to save them. Obi-Wan and Anakin engaged Dooku in combat, but the Sith defeated and nearly killed them before escaping. The Republic won at Geonosis, but the Clone Wars had begun. After healing from his fight with Dooku, Obi-Wan met with Padme without Anakin's knowledge and attempted to convince her to end the relationship he could see blossoming between the pair. Padme agreed with him, but requested that Anakin accompany her back to Naboo. Obi-Wan didn't realize at the time, but the pair would wed in secret there. The Jedi were thrust into roles of leadership in the new Grand Army of the Republic, with Obi-Wan becoming a general and Anakin a commander. Early battles included stopping Dooku's use of an ancient Dark Reaper superweapon and defending Kamino from a Separatist assault. It was on one of the moons of Naboo, and then on Quinta, that Obi-Wan first encountered Dooku's operatives Asajj Ventress and Dirge, who would prove to be recurring adversaries. Obi-Wan fought Dirge once again soon after on the banking clan world of Moon Ilinist, while Ventress challenged him and Kit Fisto on Ord Sentus. One of the most brutal trials of the early war occurred on the planet Jabim, a muddy and miserable world that was the site of a vicious separatist campaign which resulted in the deaths of many Jedi. After an explosion, Obi-Wan himself was presumed dead, but in reality, he had been captured by Ventress and taken to her homeworld of Ratatak. Their resentment for each other became more personal at her castle there. Ventress tortured Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan stole the lightsaber that had belonged to Ventress's master when he escaped. Obi-Wan and Anakin reunited with Ciri on Genian, where they defended a code breaker they had helped in their youth from the Separatists. This mission proved to be Ciri's last. She died from battle wounds in front of Obi-Wan. This loss almost drove Obi-Wan to the dark side, but the lessons he had learned from Qui-Gon helped him to deal with this turbulent emotions. Within weeks of the war's start, Obi-Wan found himself already elevated to the Jedi Council. With this position, he advocated for Anakin to be promoted to Jedi Knight, arguing that his Padawan's valiant actions during the war had proven he was ready. Now fighting as equals, Anakin and Obi-Wan defended the planet Christophsis from Separatist invasion, where Anakin received a new Padawan of his own, Ahsoka Tano. Obi-Wan soon fought with Ventress once more while Anakin and his new apprentice sealed Republic relations with the Huts. While Anakin and Ahsoka defended Batha Rui from assault by Grievous, Obi-Wan was approached by Senator Bail Organa of Alderaan, who had received intelligence pointing him towards a Sith temple on the planet Zigulla. The two embarked on a mission to investigate together, which ended with the temple successfully destroyed. Despite their initial hesitancy towards each other, and the heavy wounds they endured in the process, Bail and Obi-Wan forged a bond that would last for years. Organa soon unearthed information about a virus being developed by the Separatists on Lanteeb, which Obi-Wan and Anakin went to stop. Their mission was successful, but it came at the cost of another that Obi-Wan had once been romantically attached with, Jedi Tauria Daminson, whose terminal disease worsened after she came to his aid on the planet. Though their brief romance was years in the past, their bond ran deep, and she would not be the last person Obi-Wan lost to the war. As the first year of the war dragged on, Obi-Wan and Anakin failed to capture Dooku on Florum, helped negotiate peace among neighbors on Orto Plutonia, and traveled to Yego to secure a cure to the deadly Blue Shadow virus. Obi-Wan was key to breaking the Separatist hold on Ryloth, and fought at Geonosis once again when the Separatists constructed a massive droid factory there. Satine entered Obi-Wan's life once more after Mandalore, under her leadership became the head of the Council of Neutral Systems, composed of 1500 worlds that sought to keep their people out of the war. Sent to Mandalore after the emergence of a terrorist cell within Mandalorian culture, Obi-Wan and Satine quickly re-established their bond when they saved each other's lives once more. During this incident, Obi-Wan confessed to Satine that he would have left the Jedi for her had she asked it of him. 
Obi-Wan also reunited with Quinlan Voss on a hunt to recapture the escaped Zero the Hut. Voss had struggled with the dark side earlier in the war, and would continue to struggle with it in the future, but their friendship endured. When drawn to the mysterious world Mortis, the unique connection it had with the Force enabled Obi-Wan to commune with Qui-Gon, who warned him of the danger to be found there. The powerful Force wielders of the planet nearly caused Ahsoka's death and Anakin to be corrupted, but Obi-Wan persevered and the trio eventually woke up on their ship as if nothing had happened, leaving them to question what had been real and what hadn't been. A mission to free slaves from the Zygerians forced Obi-Wan into the role of a slave himself for a time, giving him a greater understanding of Anakin's past. Another mission saw Obi-Wan faking his death to go undercover and prevent an assassination attempt on the Chancellor, which hurt his relationship with Anakin when his former Padawan wasn't let in on the secret of his survival. Several years into the war, Obi-Wan was haunted by the return of a figure he never expected to meet again, Maul, the Sith Lord that had killed his master. Obi-Wan had believed Maul dead after he cut the Sith in half on Naboo, but Maul endured and eventually returned with cybernetics replacing his lost lower half. Maul craved revenge against Obi-Wan for his brutal wounds. Obi-Wan survived his first rematches with the Sith, but Maul found a way to cause his enemy true pain by conquering Mandalore, luring Obi-Wan into a trap using Satine, and execute the Duchess leaving her to die in Obi-Wan's arms, yet another loved one taken from him by the war. Obi-Wan's rivalry with Asajj Ventress continued to have a heavy impact on both throughout the rest of the war. Accounts differ on the location and timing, but it's generally agreed that Ventress was abandoned by Dooku after being defeated by Obi-Wan and Anakin in battle. Released from her anger and rage, Ventress found some redemption before Obi-Wan came to mourn her death. As the war stretched into its third year, Anakin and Obi-Wan were increasingly known as celebrities on the Holonet, heroes who saved scores of lives with their boldness and bravery. The duo led an assault on Kato Nimoidia to capture Newt Gunray. Though Gunray escaped, they did capture much of what he left behind, including clues that put them on the trail of Darth Sidious. The pair also sought Grievous on the planet Nelvan, where they rescued the natives from Separatist experiments. The breadcrumbs from Kato Nimoidia eventually led the two to Tithe, where they fought Count Dooku, until they were summoned back to Coruscant when General Grievous launched an attack and kidnapped the Chancellor. Flying their way through the space battle above the capital, Obi-Wan and Anakin infiltrated Grievous' flagship and made their way to where Palpatine was being kept. Dooku arrived to duel them and managed to knock Obi-Wan out with the Force. While Obi-Wan was unconscious, Anakin defeated and executed the Sith Lord. Obi-Wan woke up in the middle of their daring escape, which after a short encounter with Grievous, culminated in the ship coming down for a crash landing in the city. Anakin was soon appointed to the Jedi Council on Palpatine's orders to serve as the Chancellor's representative. Despite Obi-Wan's opposition, the Jedi Council moved to order Anakin to spy on the Chancellor and report on his actions to them. As Obi-Wan predicted, this decision furthered pre-existing tensions between Anakin and the Council. In the midst of this strain, General Grievous was discovered on Utapau, with the Separatist leaders by clone intelligence. The Council sent Obi-Wan with his battalion of clones to end the threat of the General and the war as a whole. Unlike many of their previous missions, Anakin was not sent with Obi-Wan. Despite the conflict they had experienced, the two parted ways with a fond farewell before Obi-Wan left for Utapau. Stealthily infiltrating Grievous' hideout in one of Utapau's sinkhole cities, Obi-Wan boldly jumped from the ceiling and engaged the cyborg in a lightsaber duel while his clones launched their assault. Despite Grievous' flashy tricks, he proved no match for Obi-Wan in combat, and Obi-Wan ultimately killed the general with a blaster shot to the heart. As Commander Cody and his command mopped up the last of Grievous' forces, Obi-Wan was shocked to find the clones turn on him. A cannon shot sent him falling into water, but he survived and escaped Utapau in Grievous' ship. Senator Organa recovered him from there, and along with Master Yoda, brought Obi-Wan up to speed on how the Jedi had been wiped out by the clones who served with them. As Palpatine declared the formation of his new empire, Obi-Wan and Yoda fought their way into the Jedi Temple to warn any surviving Jedi away from Coruscant. 
It was there that Obi-Wan was devastated to discover Anakin was personally behind the massacre at the temple, having been turned to the dark side by the new Emperor and becoming the Sith Lord Darth Vader. Yoda instructed Obi-Wan that their best chance to end this nascent Sith Empire was for Yoda to engage Palpatine while Obi-Wan fought his former apprentice, something Obi-Wan was unsure that he was equipped to do. Remembering their close relationship, Obi-Wan visited Padme, hoping to learn something of Anakin's whereabouts from her. Though she refused to help him out of disbelief over Anakin's fall, Obi-Wan came to realize that Anakin was the father of Padme's unborn child. He stowed away on Padme's ship when she left to confront Anakin about Obi-Wan's accusations personally. On Mustafar, Obi-Wan intervened when Vader began choking his wife out of anger. The former friends engaged in a furious lightsaber duel, all of their anger coming out as they fought over the lava. Their years of training and fighting together left them almost evenly matched, but Obi-Wan defeated his apprentice by taking higher ground and cutting off Anakin's arm and legs when he went for an attack. Anakin was burned by the lava, roaring in pain and anger at Obi-Wan. Believing his old friend to be dying, Obi-Wan sadly retrieved Anakin's lightsaber and departed with the injured and unconscious Padme in her ship. Obi-Wan met with Yoda and Organa on Paulus Massa, where Padme gave birth to twins that she named Luke and Leia. As she lay dying, Padme told Obi-Wan not to lose faith in Anakin, for there was still good in him. Organa agreed to adopt Leia while it was decided that Obi-Wan would take Luke to Anakin's family on Tatooine, where he could be raised away from the gaze of the new empire. Yoda decided to go into exile on Dagobah, while Obi-Wan would remain on Tatooine in his own exile to watch over Anakin's son from afar. Before they parted ways, Yoda revealed to Obi-Wan that Qui-Gon had discovered a way to retain his consciousness in the Force after dying which Obi-Wan's old master would be able to teach him personally in time. Obi-Wan took Grievous' ship to Nar Shadda, where he sold it and booked passage to Tatooine to give Luke to Anakin's stepbrother Owen Lars and his wife Beru. It was during this voyage that Obi-Wan remembered the visions he once had of a brother named Owen. He was reminded of Qui-Gon saying the Force would allow Jedi to glimpse the future and came to believe the Force had been telling him that he would one day see Anakin as a brother. After giving Luke to Owen and Beru, Obi-Wan began his exile. He adopted the name Ben, which Satine had once called him, after being reminded of it by a map. Soon after, he was roped into a conflict between moisture farmers and the Tusken Raiders, who he remembered from his time on Tatooine years earlier. It was in the following months that Obi-Wan came to realize Anakin had not died on Mustafar after hearing news in a cantina about Vader's triumph at Kashyyyk. He also overheard not long after that Ferris had survived the Purge and had been captured on the planet Bella Sa. At the urging of Qui-Gon's spirit, Obi-Wan went to rescue Ferris. He was successful and started Ferris on the path to finding other surviving Jedi before returning to his exile to watch over Luke. Though Ferris's goal of restarting the Jedi eventually failed, Obi-Wan gave him the task of watching over the young Leia on Alderaan. The next Jedi survivor that Obi-Wan encountered came under less pleasant circumstances. Later into his exile, Obi-Wan realized that the adopted Tusken Jedi Asharad Heth had returned to his people as a warrior, leading them against the planet's settlers, including the Larzas. Heth, who had begun edging closer to the dark side, refused to stop his attacks when confronted and Obi-Wan was forced to meet the other Jedi in battle. Obi-Wan won the duel, and Het became an outcast among his people for his defeat, swearing to Obi-Wan that he would never return to Tatooine. Obi-Wan would never see it, but this action started Het on the path to one day becoming the Sith Lord Darth Krayt. Obi-Wan continued to watch over Luke from afar for almost 20 years, only interfering when the boy's life was placed in danger. This distance came at the demand of Owen, who didn't want Luke to be drawn into the dangerous life the boy's father had chosen. All of this changed one day when Obi-Wan rescued a 19-year-old Luke from a band of Tusken Raiders and took the boy to his home where Luke revealed that Anakin's old droid R2-D2 had come bearing a message for Obi-Wan from Leia. Leia had been captured by the Empire and had placed the plans for the new Imperial superweapon, the Death Star, in the R2 unit. She begged Obi-Wan to ensure that the droid was safely delivered to Bail on Alderaan. 
Obi-Wan finally gave the young Skywalker his father's lightsaber and invited him to come along on this mission. Luke initially refused his offer, but changed his mind after the Empire murdered Owen and Beru in their hunt for the Death Star plans. Obi-Wan and Luke traveled to Moise Eisley, where they booked passage to Alderaan on the Millennium Falcon with Captain Han Solo. On the ship, Obi-Wan began to train Luke in the ways of the Force. They arrived at Alderaan to discover that the Death Star had reduced the entire planet to rubble, and their ship was soon caught in the station's tractor beam. Utilizing smuggling compartments to evade capture, the crew infiltrated the station, and Obi-Wan went off on his own to deactivate its tractor beam, while Luke and Han went to rescue Leia, who was being held prisoner nearby. After deactivating the tractor beam, Obi-Wan came face to face with Darth Vader for the first time in 19 years. The old friends engaged in one final duel, sparring with both words and blades. Obi-Wan ultimately allowed Vader to strike him down in a sacrifice that allowed Luke and the others to escape with the plans. Despite his material death, Obi-Wan's years of training with Qui-Gon proved successful. He was able to retain his consciousness from the Force. Obi-Wan spoke to Luke as Luke flew a ship against the Death Star, advising his new student to trust in the Force. This advice gave Luke the courage to make a one in a million shot that destroyed the Death Star, striking a massive blow against the previously implacable Empire. Obi-Wan continued to advise Luke spiritually on rare occasions over the following years. On Mimban, his help allowed Luke to survive a lightsaber duel with Darth Vader. He helped Luke to focus and succeed on Donoros as well. When Luke asked why Obi-Wan wasn't doing more, Obi-Wan explained he can only help to guide Luke, not fight the boys' battles for him. When Luke was laying in the ice of Hoth, slowly freezing, Obi-Wan manifested himself physically to instruct Luke that the time had come to visit Yoda on Dagobah and complete his Jedi training. There, Obi-Wan convinced the Elder Master that Luke was fit for training, and later failed to stop Luke from leaving Dagobah to confront Vader and save his friends. When Luke eventually returned, Obi-Wan talked with the young Jedi about the revelation that Vader was his father. Obi-Wan told Luke the truth about Leia being his sister, and warned him about the Emperor's power. Like his mother, Luke held firm that there was still good somewhere inside Vader, despite Obi-Wan's attempts to convince Luke that his old apprentice was too far gone. Luke was soon proven right when Vader gave his life to save his son and end Palpatine's reign, dying as Anakin Skywalker once more. Obi-Wan met Anakin again in the netherworld of the Force, instructing Anakin on how to retain his own consciousness as Qui-Gon had once taught Obi-Wan. The two were reconciled and watched over Luke as he continued on his own adventures, occasionally reaching out to help when needed. Five years after Vader's death, Obi-Wan visited Luke on Coruscant to explain that the distance between them had continued to grow and the time had come for him to move on in his journey towards what lies beyond. Luke would only hear Obi-Wan's voice one more time. Years later, as the living planet Obi-Wan and Anakin had once saved, Zonama Zakat departed after the end of the Uzong Vong War. Though his consciousness no longer stayed with the living, Obi-Wan's legacy and teachings survived through Luke, who passed them on to a new generation of Jedi that continued his fight for peace.